Technology is impactful to our souls. And that's what I want to do with the rest of our time today, to sort of survey uh, the impact of technology on our souls, and then to, to discuss and to think about a little bit how we can respond. So let's, um, let's start first by just quickly looking at what's currently going on in technology. So today in Silicon Valley, right, just over the hill here, um, uh, Silicon Valley today is largely about leveraging the internet to disrupt existing industries. And they're, they're being pretty successful at it, right? So a few examples. I mentioned earlier that I work for Netflix, right? In just 10 years, Netflix has gone from zero to 30% of all home entertainment revenues in the US. With declining customers and revenues, our existing competitors are now competing to buy increasingly more expensive content. And they're, they're caught in a real competitive conundrum. And as a result, we're seeing a wave of disruption in the existing entertainment industry. Or consider what's happening in education, right? Um, will startups like Coursera eventually connect students to educational opportunities and make expensive degrees earned by physically in, uh, attending institutions like UC Santa Cruz um, far less attractive? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Or consider retail, right? With the rise of Amazon and internet sales, it's projected that we'll see 20 to 25% of the nation's malls close in the next five years. E-commerce, right, has been growing 15% year over year. That's an incredible growth rate since 2010. Today, retail used to be brick and mortar, but today it's all about images, video, algorithms, data, and voice to make the sale. The list of disrupted industries goes on and on. For example, consider what Airbnb has done to hospitality and hotels, or what Google News did to newspapers, or what Uber and Lyft have done to taxis. The startup incubators of San Francisco and Silicon Valley, literally as we speak right now, are humming with entrepreneurial energy of folks trying to figure out the next big thing the next big idea to use the internet, internet to disrupt an industry that's stagnated. So technology is not just disrupting industries, though. It's also changing people and how we live as a result. So consider the following examples, just a few. In 1995, there was 100 million gamers. 2017, there were 2.6 billion gamers. As a result, people in today are increasingly relating to avatars instead of real people. Though fun, right, we all like gaming, online gaming can be both addictive and at times help people escape reality versus to be present with what's happening in their lives. Or consider the fact that smartphones, right, these things have grown from literally 250 million people using them in 2009 to nearly 3 billion people using them in 2016. I, I don't even own a camera anymore, or a calendar, or a watch, or a CD, iPod player, or a GPS for directions. I don't visit the bank to deposit a check, right? Like, I, it all happens through this thing. Um, so through the internet, literally through the internet and through, through a smartphone, I mean, if you think about it, nearly every piece of knowledge known to man is at our fingertips, like, if we want it, just seconds away. I would argue that the rise of smartphones has generated a huge change in expectations and in, and in our expectations. We often expect today that people are always connected, always available, or that we can never be bored or have a moment of doing nothing, right? Like you walk into a room and what do you see? You know, that's what you see when you walk into a room. Smartphones have also, they, they've literally accelerated the pace at which we're living. And then, consider this, there's the rise of so-called peer-to-peer, or the so-called sharing or gig economy. Specifically, I'm talking about the Airbnbs, Ubers, and Lyfts of the world. Companies that directly connect people to people where one person provides um, a service to another, i.e. peer-to-peer. Not too long ago, and this really speaks to me as a 40-year-old person, right? This may not speak to you all, but um, I'm showing my age a bit. I'm almost 40, I'm 39, 40 this summer. Um, I, I saw a meme on Facebook, right? Joe, maybe you'll, maybe, maybe you'll, I don't know if you're right there with me, maybe you'll resonate with this. Um, they said the following, right? When I grew up, there were two rules. This is, my parents told me these rules, right? One, you never get in a car with a stranger. And two, you never meet people off the internet, right? Yep. Now, we use the internet to meet strangers and get in the cars. Um, <laughs> technology has fundamentally affected how we live. All right, let's take a moment about, um, let's see, I think I lost the page here. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, well, let's take a moment about the near-term future. A few examples, right, of what's coming quickly. So I think the rise of VR or virtual reality will have a huge impact on how we live and relate to each other. There's a reason Facebook bought Oculus. So a quick story, right? Um, I happen to have a friend who works for Oculus uh, and he invited me which, to, to, to a lunch and to demo their gear. This would have been about two years ago now. Um, after eating lunch, you know, I got to try it out. And I've got to say, like, it was pretty incredible. 
Um, at one point, I, I was playing a virtual game of handball or badminton, and I was hitting virtual balls with a, a, a virtual racket. And I literally punched um, the ceiling of the room that I was in um, because I had forgotten that I was physically in a room. Now, lucky for me, they literally had padding everywhere, so apparently I wasn't the only one that was, you know, <laughs> getting into the game so much that, like, wham, you know, like, and you, you hit the real world, so to speak. Um, but I've got to say, like, it was pretty surreal. Now, as fun as that was, right, and, and despite all the cool possibilities, like, you can imagine surgeons using VR to do, like, surgery remotely and saving lives. There's all kinds of cool possibilities. It's easy to imagine the dark side, too. For example, if you taught the internet, brought about significant issues with pornography and sexual addiction, I mean, I'm willing to bet we haven't seen anything yet, right? Or consider this, right? My dad is a counselor in Virginia uh, and is now meeting with people who have, lived, who have been divorced by real spouses who left them for a virtual spouse. Seriously. And speaking of marriages and even dating and relationships, uh, even dating and relationships are changing dramatically. So I now I want a dicey topic here, but let me just say explicitly that I think many, many good marriages have come from, from dating sites. I've got uh, quite a few friends who met and married this way. I have no problem with them. But simultaneously, from my point of view, the sort of Tinder-driven hookup culture, has it really made a world a better place? Or the way that technology you know, reduces people to just digital images with a swipe yes or no? Um, in some ways, I'm afraid it, it actually leaves us slightly poorer, robbing us of the opportunity to navigate right that terrifying moment when you actually have to talk to somebody and ask them out. Um, dating sites, right? They've connected people together in wonderful relationships, but I would also posit that they, they also come with a cost. The list, right? Like maybe we could just spend. I could go on. The list goes on and on. Driverless cars will be here long before we know it. So long to taxis and Uber drivers. So long to parking cars or to parking lots in big cities. Will you drive to your grocery store, or will, will they drive the goods you purchase online to you? Will you own a car, or will you summon a vehicle over the internet that you pay for on a free basis? Not to mention all the times that all the time that we'll get back from no longer commuting, and the list goes on and on. The rise of wearables, whether it's Google Glass, back in the day, to fit that the advent of augmented reality and hyperlocal technology is changing at a dizzying rate today, and it's having a really big impact on people and how we live and how we relate to each other and how we relate to our world. So let's um, talk a bit, a bit deeper. I want to talk a bit deeper about the impact of technology on our souls. So a few thoughts. Um, first, technology today is bringing about what I would characterize as massive economic disruption. As old industries die and new industries are born, disruption, this, this disruption has been rapid and disorienting. Whether in retail, education, journalism, music, entertainment, etc., jobs and old economic systems are rapidly disappearing in transforming into new digital realities. The old rules and old guarantees, they, they change. Okay, so how does this affect the soul? I think this leaves many feeling left behind, right? It leaves souls, people, despairing over their value or purpose. In today's world, especially where we live here, roughly speaking, in the Bay Area, right, the tech-savvy haves get wealthy, often fabulously wealthy, and everyone else oftentimes struggles to get by. I think it's interesting to sort of see this growing economic split then through the lens of the seven deadly sins. Specifically, I think there is a reason why the, the ancient fathers included both envy and greed in the list of seven, the seven deadly sins. Whether it's massive wealth creation or economic disruption, technology has created fertile grounds, fertile ground for these two deadly sins, envy and greed, to, to spring up into our hearts. There's so much more we could say about that. But I think one of the more pressing soul issues in our area here, locally in the Bay Area, is that uncomfortable divergence between techies and everyone else. In 2017, just as a quick example, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development came out with a new survey that said a family of four making $105,000 per year or less living in San Francisco, Marin, or San Mateo counties is officially low income. For the non-tech people who lack either the education or aptitude or interests or connections or whatever, this economic disruption has resulted in fear. Will I make it? Can I pay rent? I mean, it can be a struggle. Furthermore, and I'm not trying to in any way make a political statement here, but personally, I actually think part of the recent appeal of Donald Trump in the last presidential, presidential election was rooted in some of that same fear, specifically fears of economic along with social and cultural disruption. 
So envy, greed, fear, all stoked by rapid technolo te technology-driven economic change are having a really big impact on us collectively and on our world. All right, a second thought on how technology is impacting our soul. Technology is simultaneously making us both closer and farther apart. So closer in the sense that whether through a text message or a WhatsApp or a Facebook instant message, you know, our friends are always just a few bits and bytes away. But farther in the sense that digital friends can't read your face, they can't give you a hug or hear the emotions and the inflection of your text message. Despite the myriad of ways to be closer to people, in many ways people today are more lonely than ever. A recent study of social isolation found that from 1984 to 2005, the average number of confidants someone in America has, has dropped from three down to two, which is a huge, that's a one-third drop. And now social media allows you to precisely quantify how lonely you feel based on your number of friends, or the events or parties that you were excluded from, or that person did that and they didn't invite me. This loneliness often feeds into more social media usage, and then even more feelings of loneliness. It's been shown that loneliness has a reciprocal relationship with anxiety. Anxiety leads to loneliness, but loneliness leads to anxiety. Today, I think we have lonely souls, anxious about fitting in and connecting, which then dovetails nicely into our next topic of how technology affects our soul. Today's technology means that everything is now moving faster and faster. This rapid rate of change we were talking about earlier, our, or our rapid pace of life, our feelings of isolation, and much, and much more, taken together, are leaving people more anxious than ever. The New York Times, two years ago, ran an article entitled, Prozac Nation is now the United States of Xanax. In the article, the author discusses how alarmist CNN graphics metastasize through social media, or push notifications, apocalyptic headlines, rancorous tweets, that countless studies have found links between online culture and anxiety. Our culture today is always on. The last thing we do, I do, before bed, and the first thing we do when we wake up <coughs> is we, what do we do? We check our phone. That's my white pole. Uh, well attest. And we plug in, right, to the stressors of life. So, I mean, is it any wonder that we're anxious? Hope you're okay. <laughs> um, I think that resonated. That resonated. <laughs> that one hit home. <laughs> and then there's, right, so there's the, there's a constant, the constant drumbeat uh, of news and information around security, which admittedly is kind of justifyingly nerve-wracking, right? There's our personal digital security. I, it seems like I'm always two-factor authenticating, or that no password is ever strong enough. Or there's our national security, most recently seen in the rise of disinformation techniques, or our sizable vulnerability as a country to asymmetric hacking attempts on both our physical and digital infrastructure. The world today is, is kind of like a scary place, <clears throat> in no small part due to the vulnerabilities brought by technology. Vulnerabilities that are then shared by technology to all of us, all the time, over social media pushed to our phones and invading the silent moments nonstop. So again, is it any surprise that Google searches for the term anxiety have doubled in the last five years while searches for other mental issues are relatively flat? Technology and some of the resulting anxiety is having, I would say, a big, big impact on our soul. Anxiety can create a lot of noise in our souls. It decenters us, it creates static creates lies of who we are and who God is, robs our soul of experiencing the beauty in the world, makes it hard to trust in others, so we live even more independently. It causes us to trust ourselves more, while at the same time creating a huge lack of confidence. The list goes on and on. I will say, and this is a whole separate talk, right? But anxiety can actually, and this is an aside, it can be a great invitation into prayer and into relating to God. Technology and our online culture has given rise to an anxiety and it is impacting our souls. So a fourth way that I think technology is impacting our soul. So the boundaries, right, between, and I know um, many of you are in college, but you'll be in the workforce soon enough, and many of you already have part-time jobs, but, but the boundaries between work life and personal life have all but disappeared. Again, my wife can nod her head yes, she sees us all the time. It, because it used to be that when you, when you went to work, you clocked in and clocked out, right? Or without the internet, you could literally work while you were only in the office physically. Today, I don't know a single coworker, myself included, who leaves his or her laptop at work. Like, that would be weird. Um, or who doesn't have their work email loading onto their cell phone? Work literally comes home with you every single day. Um, we, we carry it around in our pant pockets, right? We check on it at an idle moment of downtime, or maybe pumping gas, or waiting in the grocery checkout line. And frankly, no matter how fast we are in checking our phone, even after we put the phone away, our mind is still mulling over what we just read or learned. 
mm-hmm. versus genuinely being present with the people around us. Mm-hmm. So yes, right, like technology is good. I, it means we can work from home if we choose. Come in early, leave late. It gives us lots of flexibility. Yeah, I love that, right? But it also contributes to our anxiety and robs our families and spouses of our time and presence. True story. I had a coworker once who was fixing code bugs, right, logic bugs, while in the hospital with his wife, having just given birth within hours to their newborn daughter. At work, it actually became a bit of a badge of honor, a sign of commitment, right? Now, no one made him do it, or even asked him to do it, and we actually had no idea that he was doing it until it was done, but technology made that moment possible, right? So what impact is that disappearing barrier between work and personal life having on your soul, or will it have on your soul, or the souls of those around you, right? So a fifth way that technology is impacting our soul. So this is mind-blowing. In 2008, a typical adult spent 2.7 hours a day on digital media, right? Today, the typical adult spends 5.6 hours as of 2017. So in just seven, nine years, those three additional hours, right, from 2.7 to 5.6, those three additional hours, where do we think they came from, right? I mean, there's still just 24 hours in the day. So those three extra hours, 5.6 in total, come from sleep, kids, spouses, exercise, reading, time with friends, or God, even more. All this time on digital media is literally changing the physical wiring of our brains. We think differently. It's also reducing the power and strength and influence of social groups like churches or schools because we're literally not there as much. And we feel satisfied with relating to people online versus in person, or sort of satisfied. We think we're satisfied. And whether you read what the Bible says or, frankly, just consult any sociologist, they'll all tell you the importance of social groups, right, for things like raising children or simply just making it through life. They will tell you that we were made for community and relationship. I suspect my kids, our kids, um, will probably be part of the first generation to interact more with AI, artificial intelligence, than, than other people, other human beings in a given day. So Siri and Alexa and whoever else is coming. Technology is having a profound impact on our souls. It's radically changing how we live and do life, the wiring of our brains, the communities we plug into, and where we spend our time. Now, I know a lot of what I said probably comes off as if I'm somehow you know, incredibly negative on technology. I work for a tech company. And I'll admit, right, like so far I've uh, somewhat intentionally focused on some of the more negative impacts technology can have on people and on our souls. Clearly, though, I think technology has brought a lot of good too, right? Whether it's through the, just the free flow of information, the rise of maybe positive social movements on social media, modern medicine, kind of a good thing, right? Research, et cetera, technology has done a lot of good. But as with all new things, I'd argue that the new, um, that the new thing, technology in this case, comes with new pitfalls and new opportunities for vice or pain to seep into our lives. New technology, for example, can tap into the seven deadly sins or just human flaws in general in new and novel ways. For example, we've discussed how tech can empower and accelerate existing vices like workaholism, sex addiction, or ignoring your children, if and when you all have children. My hypothesis is that over time, when change happens, right, when a big technology change happens, societies learn about these sort of accompanying vices. And then they sort of, over time, they develop narratives and responses and wise sayings on how to respond to that new technology that's come about, right? But in today's age of rapid technical innovation, you know, I almost wonder, can conventional wisdom keep up? VR or AI will already be, virtual reality, artificial intelligence will already become a place before we even begin to understand and understand their downside and then learn how to handle those new technologies with wisdom. So as a, a society and community, I think we struggle to keep up and respond rapidly enough in the area of protecting our souls. Okay, so, well, how can we protect our souls through all this rapid change? What practices might we adopt to help us uh, adapt to the impact technology can have on our souls? So I have a few thoughts I'm going to share with you. They're by no means exhaustive. But I think, I think number one, I think it starts with intentionality. If technology move, makes the world move faster and removes barriers, how do we slow down? Where do you need to create barriers? Where might you create barriers with work? You know, versus having technology connect you with your phone, maybe barriers with the internet, with Facebook. How can you be intentional about going slow? Tech is addictive. I know that. Like, I literally work with 
the people and everyone's very aware that it's addictive, right? Like, for example, when you use Facebook, it literally lights up the exact same area of your brain that cocaine does. If you remove that little dopamine boost that you get from, let's say, watching a Netflix show, you need to replace it with something else, right? Going cold turkey, cold turkey, frankly, rarely works. So what new habits do you need to form? What apps might you need to delete? You know, and again, not trying to make a political statement here, but after the last political election, this is a couple years ago now, Facebook was frankly filled with so much, so much vitriol and apocalyptic fear, it was actually really affecting me and weighing me down. I noticed that I would often check Facebook while at work and walking from meeting to meeting, probably a half dozen to a dozen times a day. So I deleted Facebook from my phone. Now I still will use it through like Safari and the web browser. Mm -hmm. um, but just that simple barrier of getting rid of the app, making it a little bit harder to access, had a really noticeable impact on my usage and frankly my mindset. Or another example, so I'm a working stiff. Uh, I used to listen to NPR all the time while commuting in my car. But I've significantly cut back. Why? Not because ignorance is bliss somehow, though it sometimes is nice. <clears throat> but perhaps I don't need to spend 45 minutes a day listening to news stories about everything that's going wrong in the world, right? I still listen to NPR to be informed, but just not as much as I used to. So my question is, where do you habitually engage, habitually engage with tech in your life in a fashion that's bringing harm to you? Or this was a talk originally for a non-college audience. So harm to you or harm to your family? What can you do to create a barrier and make it a little bit harder, maybe, to have that tech in your life? How can you be more intentional in how you live? That's a question. I, I don't expect you to have answers now, but something to think about, to carry away, and to ponder. Okay, and then more than just being intentional in how we live, I think there's a second thing we can do about the impact of tech in our life, and that's to sort of turn tech into an ally. Because remember, it's not all bad. There's some good to it, too. So I, you know, I've just been saying all throughout this talk that tech is not all bad. It's just impactful. And though I haven't focused on them, I have personally found that technology can have also a really positive impact on your soul. So let me just give you a few examples that I use in my own personal life of how I've turned tech into an ally, right? So like many of you, I drive back and forth to work or school each day. And so for me, I've discovered there's this app, uh, Pray As You Go, the podcast. I listen to it in the morning on the way into work. Um, it's sort of like a guided period of reflection. I read a passage of scripture and then there's a time for prayer. Um, and then on the way home, I, I listen, you know, I'm, I'm from the Anglican tradition, so I listen to Evening Prayer from the Trinity Mission. But there's a link off of Redeemer's website. For me, that time has become a great way to intentionally get just more scripture and prayer into my life, right, through technology. And repurposing time that I'm already in the car anyway, and better than just being on NPR, why don't I listen to Pray As You Go and pray? Or listen to Evening Prayer and, like, hear some scripture, right? Um, if... It, it, frankly, those apps also help me, frankly, transition from being in work mode to family mode, which for those of you, um, there's not many of you, but for my wife, as she can attest, that know me, that transition can be really hard to get out of the, the fix-it work mode into the more relating family home mode. Another example, I've got an app on my phone, and now we don't need it anymore. This talk was a year and a half old, because Apple added an app as well. Um, but I've got, you all have an app on your phone, or Apple, your iPhone will do it for you, that monitors how much time you use your phone. So why did I get that app? Well, to be honest, partially because I kept hearing from my wife that I was always on my phone. And so I wanted to start measuring it concretely. And if I'm really honest, mostly to prove her wrong, and of course then to right, rub it in her face like any good husband would do. Pro tip, don't do that. <laughs> Pro tip, right? Thankfully for our marriage, instead of becoming about right or wrong, once I started measuring it, it actually sort of became a competition with myself. I'm kind of a competitive individual. But it became a competition with myself to see how little time I could spend on my phone in a given day, right? Because every time you look at the stack, they show you week over week. And then I go, oh, awesome. Like, am I getting better or getting worse? So I was competing with myself to minimize usage. All, of course, technology was helping me to minimize the use of technology, which is a little ironic. Okay, so final example. Um, I'm the type of person that uh, I just don't often naturally, organically remember other people. Just don't. I get very focused on tasks. So I have found, some of you, sounds like if that resonates with a few of you, I have found that I need to be very intentional in remembering. So from time to time, I've literally scheduled into my work calendar 15 minutes to either maybe call my wife or my dad or to think about my daughter's special award ceremony that day or to plan something or to write an email to a friend. I block it on my calendar. It pops up on my phone or on my laptop, and then it's in my inbox. So for me, it's a really great way of using technology to remind myself to stop what I'm doing, 
and to attend to something else, maybe reading the scriptures or praying. So there's a few examples of how I've been able to turn tech into an, an ally. So frankly, I bet there's endless, I mean, right, those are just three examples of how you can turn tech into an ally. There's probably endless examples and possibilities out there. So intentionality, how can we turn tech into an ally? And then a third way that I think we can respond to the impact technology is having on our soul is to intentionally look to connect. So earlier I spoke about how in some ways technology can create fear in people. It can foster the creation of socioeconomic barriers. It can also create separation between you and your spouse and kids. And those barriers in many ways frankly leave our souls and relationships a bit impoverished. I would argue that it's important to find a way to reach across those divides. Um, Reaching across those divides with your family may look like finding ways to be intentional with your children or spouse for a dedicated period of time with your full focus. Reaching across socioeconomic barriers may mean tackling head-on the inclination we may have towards greed or envy within our own hearts. And there's a lot we could say about that. And crossing the fear barrier may mean that we lean in um, towards embracing change with, of course, discernment and trust in God. And what I mean by that is embracing in the sense that we recognize that a new disruptive technology has arrived, knowing that it's probably realistic to assume that that new technology is here to stay, like AI and VR, and then figuring out how to adapt to it versus simply boycotting it. While simultaneously being thoughtful about how that technology could negatively affect us. We can mitigate, I believe, the negative impact of technology on our souls by proactively looking to connect (coughs) across barriers within our families, across socioeconomic lines, and across the fear that can divide us. So, to sort of close and bring it all together, in my opinion, technology is neither inherently all good or all bad, but it's impactful. And specifically, I think when technology falls into the hands of a group of broken and flawed people, that is to say, the human race, all of us, despite all of its promise and potential and hype, there's almost always going to be a dark side. I mean, I just guarantee it. Which I suppose is what happens when broken people inhabit a good world. And as a Christian, I'm convinced that only God, or only through God, can I successfully sort of overcome my propensity towards abusing and misusing technology. And so regardless of where you're at in this room today in terms of faith, I hope that my talk um, has helped you maybe to consider a few ways that technology could be having a negative impact on your soul. I hope you'll find ways in your own life that you can be more intentional in your relationship with technology, that you can find ways to turn technology into an ally, and specifically that you can find more ways to be intentional and to connect with those around you. So, thanks. I think, Thomas, is there supposed to be any questions Q&A, or something? Yeah. Q&A. Not that I have anything. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, so, when I think about um, uses of technology, big technological advances in the past, there's been, like, you know, our Christian founder or fathers who um, use the printing press to yeah. spread. Um, totally. Yeah, the yeah. Bible. And, um, Great example, technology there, being so positive for the good. Right. So is there a way that um, that you found that's a really good use of technology for ministry, for like um, evangelism and things like that? I mean, First thing that comes to mind is the Jesus film from Campus Crusade, right? Like how many people have seen that film and been affected? Um, but to your question, yeah, how many, how, how can technology be used for good in terms of ministry? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Courtney, feel free, by the way, to jump in. But, I mean, so the thing with the, inter- you know, the phone is, right, like you've got everything ever known to man at your fingertip, both all the bad stuff, but also all the good stuff. So I even, I think, alluded to it just a little bit in my own life. But um, whether it's listening to, you know, you know uh, guided prayer or hearing the scripture, right, like, Courtney often like has this app, has the Bible on her phone, and she oftentimes will just play it in the background. Uh, driving over here, I, we had worship songs going on through iTunes on her phone, plugged into our car, right? I mean, so I think like there's almost countless ways, I guess, and not to like brush off the. Well, I guess I meant more like for evangelism rather than like personal edification. Oh, what do you all think? <laughs> Jesus film was the first idea that came to mind. Other thoughts? Christian movies are pretty bad. Say what? <laughs> we have a, we support some missionaries here uh, who, uh, they actually, they, they work with Wycliffe, uh, Bible translators, 
and they they lived in Papua New Guinea and then Thailand for a number of years. They're now because of their family dynamic, their kids are older, high school age now. They're back in the states. They're in Colorado, and he is he actually worked for Apple back when they first started in the yeah. early 80s. So when it was like 20 people, he was one of the first group and had the opportunity to stay and make you know millions and millions mm-hmm. and billions of dollars, but saw the path that that was that that was before him and then saw the skills that he had and made the decision to use those skills for good and not for evil. No, for, um, <laughs> hey, <don't make> it. <laughs> so this, to decide to use those skills in a specific way for ministry. And so what he has been doing for the past 15, 20 years, um, maybe 25 years now, um, has been developing um, uh, software that allows uh, indigenous people to do their own Bible translation. Um, and so they've been wor- actually working with the World Health Organization as well uh, in producing literacy apps that, uh, that teach, both teach and help instruct and then help um, people learn how to read. Now, it has a, a, a wide usage with every non-literate culture uh, in teaching literacy of their own language. Um, a few of the people who know how to, once the once Wycliffe has taught those those people how to use the language that they've helped create, they're able to input that language into the program, and then teach the language. But then they're also able to uh, help translate the Bible uh, through that technology. Yeah. And this is, this is something that he's been developing over the past, you know, 10, 15 years. So using it directly using this type of technology, the new internet, mega data, big data. Uh, technology for the sake of uh, simplified Bible translation in the field. Yeah, I'll give you another example. When you talk about translation, right, like, um, you know, in Netflix, like, you have subtitles, but then we use machines to translate those titles in every language around the world. So you can imagine the, you know, at the core of evangelism is communicating a message, and that message needs to be translated into as many languages as possible. Well, there you go. I'll give you another sort of, like, really archaic, somewhat esoteric example, like, of a story where I was sort of doing some evangelism in my own personal life. Um, got some coworkers, you know, we, we go out to dinner about every two months. They're not Christians, um, but they're definitely like spiritually interested. And so we were having a conversation and it's complex, more of like an evangelistic conversation. And I was talking about, um, I was giving an example, you know, they're kind of skeptics, agnostics about the Bible. And so we, they were talking about, so you read the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel has all these prophecies. Mm-hmm. And specifically, there's a prophecy about like um, the, the, the kingdoms that were going to come. So you have like the Greek kingdom and uh, the Babylonians before them, and then maybe the Romans after it. So there's a, there's a reference in there. Okay, if you're a skeptic, this is complex. So maybe I shouldn't have gone down this path. But if you're a skeptic and you don't believe in the supernatural, you would assume that the book of Daniel was written after, right? There's no supernatural. Therefore, the book of Daniel must have been written after 330 AD when... Alexander the Great died and the empire broke up into four pieces because everybody recognizes that, that prophecy in Daniel clearly was referring to the Greeks. So what you're saying to yourself as a skeptic is it must have been written after 330 AD. Okay, that's fine. And actually for a long time, for a very long time, um, you know, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, people thought that the book of Daniel was written, you know, maybe a thousand years after like the events happened in the real world. Well, shoot. Then there was this little thing called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Does anybody know what the Dead Sea Scrolls is? Are? Oh, man, this is esoteric. So the Dead Sea Scrolls was um, in this area of, um, you know, Israel. Um, there, there, was a, there was a community called the, the Qumran community, and they didn't, when, when, the, when their book of scriptures um, would decompose, they would put it in, a, in a, a vase and they would stick it in a cave because they didn't want to burn it, but they didn't want to keep it because it was decomposing and it was no longer legible, right? So what happened was they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s. It was amazing. Like, literally, the earliest copy we had of the Hebrew Bible prior to the 1940s was right around 1000 AD. Because the Jewish people, they were very diligent about copying and destroying their own copies. But suddenly, we found copies of the Old Testament that were more than 1,000 years old. Right? The Book of Daniel, in particular, some of the very earliest copies of the Book of Daniel that we have found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in a cave was somewhere around 100 BC. Right? Which means that you now know that the Book of Daniel was written by right around 100 BC, literally just 250 years after the events that the book of Daniel describes. So what that then means is that 
the book of Daniel was, it got to the point where that community considered it to be sacred scripture in about 100 to 150 years, which is extreme. I mean, it took the New Testament about three to 400 years before it was canonized and it became sacred scripture. All that to say, very complex information, very complex idea that I was explaining to these guys that I was having dinner with. Where did I come up with all this? This thing, right? Like, I'm like, when was the book of Daniel discovered in the Dead Sea, in the Dead, um, uh, in the Dead sea Scrolls? Google, tell me, please, right? So, as an example. Very long winded example. I mean, you could. There's airplanes, like, airplanes are used in missions all the time now for getting to remote places, and um, wells and water are huge ev evangelistic tools for, um, uh, especially in remote places and countries. Uh, so those are what came to mind, but I was trying to think of some, like, locally. Like, locally, what are some things that we use? I just think Google is, like, people have questions. I gave a really example of an archaic question that I was, an archaic question that I was asked. Like, people have questions all the time. Like, you know, like spiritual related questions and all kinds of crap comes up. But again, there's an opportunity to maybe put something out there that's not crap. Yeah. Other questions? Or thoughts? Hey, yeah. Have you read uh, The Benedict Option? I've heard of it. I've not read it. Okay. What did you hear? Or um, what's in it? It's, it's very interesting. A lot of stuff that. Uh, a lot there's there's some there's a lot of worthwhile stuff in there. Yeah. Um, I think his his uh, call to retreat from culture is misguided. Yeah. Uh, he says that we should you know hole up in monasteries again, basically. Um, but he has this interesting uh, toward the latter. He's talking about technology. Yeah. And he he we totally agree, and as I do, and as as you mentioned, uh, it's morally neutral, right? There's no inherent sin or wickedness in in a phone, a, phone, a technological device, it's, yeah. it's morally neutral. But he, he made the point that it's not ideologically neutral, mm. that it, communica it comes out of and it communicates an ideology, uh, or at least it, um, it, uh, uh, it resonates more closely with certain ideologies. Mm. Um, you know, I just thought, what do you, what do you think about that? What, do you have an example of how it really resonates with more? I, so, that, yeah. so perhaps, um, and, and maybe that's just a, a fancier, big, bigger word way of saying that it um, speaks to our 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 inner demons. Um, but say, um, for example, uh, Facebook um, is again morally neutral. It's yeah, a, it's just a technological web page that does things. Um, but what it it fosters and what it resonates with is a um, is a an ideology of Im impersonality um, of of remove of of separateness uh, and then it and then it um, I'm not doing it all a good job of um, being coherent here but it uh, it fosters uh, a a sense of um, immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. um, that what I want is what uh, what is right, and so I need to go. I can because I can, or say, take Google. Or the internet in general, is immediate gratification. Right, because I I want it, and I have a right to go get it, and this is this is reinforcing that 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 thought that because I can get it, it therefore is right for me to go. Yeah, or that like maybe that ideology of like you know. Uh, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, work really hard, and now I can right. because like the internet can, has potential to keep me always connected, right? right. There's the upside, uh, again, that I can work from home and that's wonderful. I can you know come and go as I please. Mm -hmm. But if there is this uh, underlying pernicious ideology of like work hard mm -hmm. and workaholism, as a more more general sense of that, which I think we as Americans and, and, and Silicon Valley these high hygiene, hygiene workaholics, yeah. I mean the internet can sort of just pour gasoline on that um, proclivity. That maybe you may have. So, so then the the question becomes: Is are there certain technologies that that are that that foster that and resonate with that ideology more than other ones? Like electricity, we don't really necessarily think of as as harboring those those darker sides. Or I think it can. I think it keeps us up later at night. 
I think it changes. <laughs> the, 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 the light bulb was revolutionary. Light. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't. I, I actually I think there probably is. I I think maybe I would even say definitely there are some that create habits in mm-hmm. our souls that are not healthy. Yeah. More than others. Yeah. I, I think that's true. Mm-hmm. But I also think you can also be aware of what habits you are creating by certain things that you use and you know I, I think you have to and you can choose like good habits and bad habits so like say with lights you know it can be creating a habit of I don't know I'm a limited human being that needs sleep oh my goodness uh, it's three o'clock in the morning I should have gone to bed five hours ago you know that's that those are those are teaching our souls hypothetically speaking <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know anyone here you know <laughs> 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 But then you can also create habits of electricity that really are for good. So I would say probably a Facebook, definitely a Tinder, probably has more habits that are so, ideologically not as healthy. Based. So so it just goes back to your point of intentionality and growing in wisdom and discernment, being aware of what what this what the temptations are that are inherent to this type of technology and being wise and how do I navigate that? Because again, there's nothing inherently evil in that. What ideologies am I um, saying yes to? And and perhaps doing so unconsciously without discernment. You have to pay attention to the unconscious when you're dealing with technology. Yeah, Yeah, and I certainly think you're talking about ideology. I certainly think, I mean, people that are working in Silicon Valley, they're well aware of human, I mean, they're well, I mean, I have, there have been explicit conversations where people are well aware of human frailty, mm-hmm. and like, how do I take advantage of that right. effectively to further usage of my app, right? That's, I mean, that's why they gamify everything, mm-hmm. is because, as strange as it seems, we all apparently like little badges and notifications and like imaginary like goods. Seems weird, mm-hmm. except, except it's shown. Sense of accomplishment. accomplishment. Yeah. Sense of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Yes, I got like three more. Icons or badges, I'm collecting them now. Snapchat, uh, Snapchat chains. Yeah. Or streaks. <laughs> Snapchat chains. <laughs> I'm old. Oh, sure you know. <laughs> Snapchat streaks. Yeah. 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 That's actually yeah. something interesting. It's, it, it is, I, I think his conclusions are wrong because he says the the uh, what we should do is just isolate ourselves from from it all, and I don't think that's the right response. You know, I would, just as my own, my own two cents, I don't think we should permanently isolate ourselves. And again, I mean, I work part-time company. But I do think that sometimes actually it is good for me to temporarily isolate myself. Mm-hmm. Which well, is well, a... Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. I think you agree with, yeah. Which yeah. is like, I found that that's actually healthy. Yes. Um, I, it's healthy to shut down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and sort of to, to, to give something up. To remember that, like, um, rather than letting my appetites master me, mm-hmm. like, I can be the master of my appetites. Yeah. This is a little bit of a tangent. Like I think so many people think that you know true happiness is actually being able to do whatever you want and have whatever you want, but the reality is that's actually not the case. Yeah. Like true happiness actually isn't really found in eating whatever you want, drinking whatever you want, sleeping with whoever you want. Like it's actually not true happiness. Right. Actually, if you go down a path of just totally indulging your appetites and having whatever you want, that leads to destruction, mm-hmm. and frankly, that leads to misery. Um, and so yeah, yeah, bit of a rant there. But, yeah, no, no. I that's say, that's I what we're talking say, about this morning. Uh, yeah. <coughs> like say say a Tinder for example, like and nowadays there's like so many dating sites, right? I think one thing we can do is there's they have different ways of doing it, right? So Tinder is like you're you're sliding, you're looking at this image, you're just saying yes or no, you don't know the person. I mean, what habit is that creating in you? And I would say it's not a good one. Right. So. But like judging you, based on looks and appearances, boom. But you could then maybe choose, because dating sites aren't necessarily inherently wrong, you could choose a website where you are not stepping into habitual things that are teaching your soul, like, the, that these are not images of, or, you know, creations of God type things. So you can be picky. You know, and and really pay attention to, okay, 
this one, you know, <laughs> maybe what? I do not step into this one. And, and, and going off of that, sorry everybody, this is, we're just kind of going on a uh. chat here. <laughs> 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 It is probably different for every person too. So it's being well, self-aware. Well, that's probably true. It's being self-aware. What am I tempted to? Yeah. What are my weaknesses? Mm -hmm. What are my frailties? In what directions do my mind yeah. go just unconsciously that aren't healthy? Yeah. And then yeah, how do I thing. how do I curtail my my tech usage to like yeah. somebody else can use Facebook and be totally fine. Mm -hmm. One person can use Facebook and then just be utterly despairing and want to take their life. Yeah. Um, so. Who am yeah. I? What are my weaknesses? How do I be aware of, of what's happening? Self awareness is huge. What are your weaknesses to defend against technology, but also where can technology help you in your weaknesses? Because mm -hmm. I gave that one example of where I get, I get lost and over focused. And so suddenly my phone starts going, it's oh, telling you. It's telling me, like, wake up. It's time to go home. Yeah. Like, don't show up late. That won't work well for your marriage. <laughs> go home now. Yeah. 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 Just as a hypothetical example. Don't tell you all that. It's like a Yeah. Alert. I like the phrase that you used of how can you, it's almost like you're like getting one better up on technology. Like, how can you use technology as an ally? Yeah, it's an ally. Like, yeah. Yeah. So how do you plan on applying technology to your kids' lives? Because I think one thing that's interesting about college students, about even myself, about kids, is that their self ability to know where they're weak in uh, is limited. True. But not only that, but their ability to control it. Like they may know like, okay, Facebook's my weakness, but I love it, so I keep checking it. And I don't want to delete the app because that's weird. So for you, how do you plan on, and maybe you don't know yet, like how are you guys thinking about, okay, with my kids? How am I going to deal with technology? I mean, I know you guys have Alexa, so it's like... Yeah, so I'll be honest, number one, like, I'm terrified. Um, Courtney, you should chime in here with your thoughts, too. Um, I, you know, I, I will say that, like, so we have um, a daughter that's seven and two boys that are five and five. So we do, I mean, we limit, um, we do limit their use of technology, right? Um, there's just, I think there's a lot of solid science, for example, that shows that, you know, for young brains, it's not good to be on the television or on screens all the time. So we, def we let our kids watch cartoons and TV, but we don't let them watch. I mean, if it was up to them. Again, getting, speaking of getting your appetites, if it was up to them, they would watch TV for eight hours a day and eat chocolate all the time, right? So like, you know, we, we let them watch some TV, but definitely not eight hours, right? Like we limit it down. So, um, like we haven't got, I mean, our, my daughter started asking me for an iPad in first grade. And now she's in second grade. We haven't got her an iPad. A lot of toddlers have iPads these yeah. days because parents use them on planes and driving and so they can have shows. It's their real parent. And my daughter was seeing like these on the airplane and and like friends at school have them. Friends at school have them and we're like, no. <laughs> so I think yeah, those are you know, so I mean right now they're at a younger age and I think we've largely taken I'm trying to think of, we've largely taken an approach of placing limits. On it, like no, you, you can't. Basically, right now we have TV, and my our kids listen to music on Alexa. I don't, I think I'm gonna be pretty strict on it. I, I heard a talk at a mom's thing I was in of how even um, kids having smartphones, they can get Google, and they can Google like anything mm -hmm. on that, and how they get horrible information. And instead of going to parents to be taught, you know, and in regards to pornography, they can look up whatever they want. Um, but you take a single picture of yourself and then uh, risk A, it's around forever. And, yes, and yeah, the effects of taking pictures, putting pictures online, the effects of nowadays, um, like abuse perpetrators, like it's a high percentage through the internet of how they like, catch people's, you know, they people want affirmation, people want this and they do it um, online. Now, big time. Um, and so, and then also the learning how to relate to people. And so I, I'm, I, I, <laughs> I'm probably, I, I don't think I want my kids to have a smartphone. I, I think even through 30? Yeah, no, 30. we're making this up, we're making this up as we go, honestly. <laughs> right. as, as I think a little bit more, like, I think it's about, and this is true of so many things, but it is probably to some degree about, like, you know, a little, as they get older and start having a bit more wisdom and a bit more sort of self-awareness and um, 
like okay a little bit more a little bit like because as, as an aside like that's you so have much to train them to use it yeah. too yeah you so. train them right. yeah you don't want to just like go to college and woohoo yeah like, that's true um yeah. like so i think there could be some wisdom is uh, you know slowly and gradually giving people like more and more your, your children more and more autonomy but not being naive but certainly not you know letting them have it willy-nilly before they know what to do the age of uh, exposure to porn has dropped to like six very yeah. young very, and because of, and because of that, like sexual abuse, abuse kid to kid has skyrocketed. Yeah. yeah. Because kids, you know, like this, let's say six year old sees something on the internet, and then he or she does it to the other six year old because they just saw it on the internet. Right. Um. So. Anyway, like yeah, but I, there can be like a gradual. Um, I think probably like part of parenting, and we need to talk about that more and more. But largely part of parenting probably will be like slowly over time, gradually giving them more access to technology. Yeah. So, Man, so I'm just hard. even thinking about how my kids <laughs> play with other friends who see movies that I would never let my kids see, and then talk about it. Like I'm like, when my fir- when my kids first started talking about zombies, I was like, how do you even know what a zombie is? <laughs> <laughs> but in TK, like kids have seen those shows and they're now playing it, and now my kids are playing it. So like, the internet, even like. <laughs> The flow from one to the other, like even if my kids aren't on the internet, they still get, you know, inundated to stuff. It's luckily you crazy. have an opportunity, you know, to um, like you can see that a little better than if, for example, your kids were just watching all of that. You don't know what they're watching, yeah. and then they talk to their friends about it when when they hear it from their friends, and then it's like it, that's something new, and you still have a relationship well enough to address those things because you see, how do they know about zombies? Like, we haven't watched anything about zombies, so you talk to them about, like, you know, you have a way to um, be training them in discernment yeah. uh, instead of them being left to their own devices all the time, you know? <laughs> devices, literally. <laughs> <laughs> There's that verse, uh, I think it's in the end of Philippians, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, or I don't know if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about it all the time. Um, that's an example, I think, where like technology can sort of like um, help us sort of follow Paul's advice or disobey Paul's advice yeah. um, because it's access to information. Which verse was that? I think it's Philippians four eight four eight nine. I remember in middle school. I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but like a couple of guys were talking about masturbation, and then me and my friends. The girls were like, "What's masturbation? It's probably like a machine or something. Like master, I don't know." And so like, I, I think we even spelled it wrong, but we found it and we were like, there were like images. Yeah. And we were like, we didn't even know that was like a penis. Yeah. But then we were like, what? And then, and then our kids are gonna be able to like figure that out. I'll be honest, it scares me a little bit. It's totally scares me. So. Let's just say, I know this is probably not anybody here, but let's just say I'm in college. Hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically speaking, right? But I'm, I lack the wisdom to use my device for better, and I tend to use it for worse more often than not. Like, whether it's Netflix binging, whether it's Instagram scrolling that feeds insecurity, whether it's like feeling FOMO from Find My Friends, like whatever it is, right? I find that my device is getting the better of me. What? should we do about it? Because to some degree, it seems unreasonable for us to live without it. And maybe we need to say it is reasonable and that's what we should do. And all of us here, or none of us here, but those who hypothetically would struggle with it should get flip phones. Like, like, what's the, like what's the reasonable or wise approach to like, okay, so like, yeah, technology affects us, but we're so deep in it, what do we do? Yeah. Especially in college, you know, like, it's, it's kind of crazy sometimes. Yeah, so I talked about it a little bit in my talk about like intentionality and potentially creating barriers. Like, and I gave a little example of where I deleted the Facebook app from my phone. Um, but, you know, so I'm assuming that though we may like in the moment just start binge watching our way through Netflix, um, which by there was a reason that they, you know, have only five seconds from the end of one show to the next show. You better believe they tested that, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, I found that sweet. Uh, point in time where it was optimal to maximize the amount of viewing hours and watching. Don't put that on. Don't tweet that. That I just said that. <laughs> That's totally like a video. <laughs> um, 
Sources. But yeah, <laughs> that barriers, barriers, right? Like what kind of barriers can we put into our life? So I, I mean, I think there's probably, I mean, yeah, Thomas, it's, it's hard, right? Like, but I do think that there's real wisdom in understanding that there may be, you know, I'll use like a very non-technical example, right? Like, um, I probably don't want to walk into a strip club where there's a bunch of naked women. Like, I just, that's probably, like, I probably don't even want to go into that building because I'm probably going to sin if I go into that building, right? Like, so, you know, converting it over to technology, like, there, there may be things that I, 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 there may be barriers that I want to put into place, right? So, I mean, there are, I think, apps out there that can limit phone usage. Um, you know, there are, you, if there are certain things you need but you don't want the password, you can give your password to someone else. You can delete apps, you can delete accounts. Like, there are, and I know, like, you don't want to be that weird eccentric that, like, is just totally, like, I'm going to use an extreme example, walking around like an Amish person with a horse and buggy, like, I'm not proposing that. But at the same time, right, like, sometimes that sounds really nice. <laughs> yeah, let's be honest, right? Rick um, Yeah, I think boundaries um, can be one um, helpful thing. I also think, um, you know, transparency and accountability um, for whatever that vice may be, mm-hmm. um, I think is, you know, another op- option. Um, and then I think also, like, um, core to the Christian message, I mean, just at the very core, is we all, we all sin, and we mess up all the time. But when we sin, and when we mess up, I mean, we kind of have two choices there, right? Like, on the one hand, we can kind of wallow in being a sinner, mm-hmm. and just wallow and, like, double down and just do it, whatever that it is, more and more. Or we can go to Jesus and talk to him about it. Um, and open our hearts to his love and grace or whatever that may be. Basically, go to the cross and interact with the Lord over whatever that may be. I think that's an important piece, too. Amen. I don't know, Courtney, if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have anything to add. But I would say, like, if it extremely is habiting your life in a... Um, harmful way, then a lot of times you do have to do the extreme measure to, um, I know that's not what we want to hear, right? Like, that is so hard, but I think sometimes I'm like, flip phones were so much better. <laughs> Landlines were so yes. Yes. What are you talking about? Landlines <laughs> <laughs> so And all <laughs> I, I think, like, moderation, I don't know, if, if I, I may be the only one here, but is moderation, like, hard? Like, being moderate in our appetites? Yeah. yeah. Like, I yes. totally, like, I'm the type of person, like, I like, I don't even want to buy ice cream. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I have ice cream in my freezer? I can just, I can eat half a gallon. I mean, I can't. I don't do it that often, but, but I could. Right? And so, like, I think, I, so then what, I will, what I'll do is I'll react, I say, I'm not ever going to buy ice cream. Yeah. But then that sucks. You know? <laughs> So it's hard. I'll just, it's hard to be like one Netflix show and then I'm gonna go to bed, not three Netflix shows. It's, or it's eight. telling that or eight. it's telling that <laughs> self control is a fruit of the spirit. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there. It's, not, it's not something that we can just do in our own strength. It's it's a fruit that the spirit and only the spirit can engender in us as we abide in Christ. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's abiding in Christ and praying for self control. And, and I will say one more, just as an interesting discipline. So today, we're like we're in the season of Lent right now. Tomorrow's Easter. Yay! Tomorrow's Easter. Yeah. But like, I, so for me, like I'm I'm a fan of Lent as a season. It sounds weird, um, but like one thing that I, you know, so you know, it's part of Lent. Like what you do is you you give up give up something. Um, and I have found in my own life that like so I might give up different things. Like maybe I give up chocolate or sugar. Like I'll give up sugar, or maybe I give up coffee, or I'll say I'm not gonna you know, have ever had like a glass, I'm not going to have a glass of wine during Lent. And that phrase that I talked about, like I think during Lent that it, one of the things that you can learn during a season of Lent, right, if you view it as like a spiritual formation exercise as a discipline, um, as an invitation to just remember once again that we're not mastered by our appetites, but that we can be the master of our appetites through the Spirit. Um, so that's also just, right, like, like, you know, it doesn't have to be Lent, but like as an example, like maybe you're struggling with you know FOMO and Instagram or whatever it was that you talked about. Maybe you give up Instagram for Lent, like so. I, you know, that can be like I think you know just as a as a potential discipline, a spiritual discipline that you can relate to the Lord and open your heart to Him. Yeah. Other. I think uh, going off of what Thomas was saying about like the social media and stuff, but I feel like what you were saying about um, 
kind of the working culture of America and how technology with like email or like Slack and how employees have to be like constantly available now. And that's kind of the norm. And so I feel like the what like I I wondering like what can be the balance because employers are having this sort of expectation that you will be always available. And so where to find that balance with that So I, I mean this may sound so two things I'll say. Um, as an employer, and I'm not literally a company, but like I have people that report to me, mm-hmm. and I'll tell my employees like, just like, for example, if you get an email from you on the weekend, it doesn't mean that you have to respond on the weekend just because your boss emails you on the weekend. It honestly just may be that like, I'm taking advantage of the good of technology and getting in a little bit of work because I went home early on Friday, and therefore I'm gonna work an hour Saturday morning to finish up that thing that I that I didn't finish on Friday because I you know, took my, went to my daughter's like preschool practice or whatever. Um, so as an employer, like I've set an expectation with people that report to me that just because you get, I, I will put in the subject line like urgent, and I never do that, you know. But like, so I tell people don't feel the, res- the need to respond. But then to your question, right, in the work culture, I also think I mean, like sometimes it just I, I have you know been working, gosh I got out of I've been working professionally you know after the church at 2006. So in 2006 I went back to work or like um, away from the church in, the, in a professional role. And I had, it was kind of, a, it was my first job, but it was kind of a crappy company. And like, I had this president of this company, like I put together a, a presentation and shared it out. It was kind of 200 person company. President got it, read it, didn't like what I had done. Um, got on the phone with me and was screaming at me for 15 to 30 minutes, just like, just berating me for not doing the thing that he wanted me to do. Um, even though no one ever told me I needed to do it, he just was still like berating me for it. You know, it's, oh yes sir, yes sir. You know, kind of like fixed the presentation. <clears throat> you know, sent it out. He was happy. The moment passed. I also decided, you know what? This guy's like, I don't want to work here anymore. Like this guy's an idiot, and I'm just like, I'm gonna switch jobs. And you know what? I did. And like, I'm just so I think like honestly like. There's also a place for like if you're working for like a crappy employer mm-hmm. that's like berating you or treating you like in an abusive type of type of situation, like I was sort of in like leaving is always a choice. You know? <laughs> Having a conversation is always a choice, right? Like setting boundaries is always a choice, right? I mean like mm-hmm. I, I'm sort of challenging and pushing back on this notion of like where we might see ourselves as a victim. I mean, we may be the victim of something that an employer does to us, like they mistreat us. But then we have a choice in our end to say like, well, I'm gonna just keep going back for more, versus like, <laughs> I'm not. And, sorry, <laughs> like, and I know it's more complex than that. Like sometimes when you're just out of college, or depending on your back, like you know, some industries are, uh, some industries um, the employee has more leverage, and in some industries the employee has less leverage. But I think at the end of the day, we do have choices as people in terms of what we accept and tolerate. So that's kind of my two cents. I think, just to add to that too, it also depends where you work, obviously, Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of um, those kinds of rights are protected. Um, like, mm-hmm. I work for a, co- a big, pretty big corporation, and um, I'm hourly, which is nice, because if they call me or hey, send yeah. me an email or expect me to work, I can charge them for that, um, or I can just not look at it, because um, they have a certain, you know, there's boundaries, and, and I know on our team there are some people that will, like, any time of the day, whatever they want, um, like, whenever anybody wants, they'll, they'll respond right away, but we also have certain people on our team who are known for, like, oh, you can't call him after hours, he doesn't check his work phone, he doesn't, we have several work phones, which is nice, but, you know, he doesn't check his whatever, and, and what I've noticed is if you start a job, and you are like that, then you become known like that, and yeah. then you can keep those boundaries. Um, if you start to be the person like at five, then yeah. I'm, I'm not checking anything, you can't get a hold of me. If you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me during work hours kind of thing. I, I think she's totally right. Like, ah. you sort of, the way you behave, also the train, you, you kind of train your colleagues and your coworkers. And if you sort of like, are known for always being available and always on, then um, not even, people aren't even trying to take advantage of you. They're just like, oh, don't fire this so. They're fine with it. Like, I can text them at all hours, and they'll respond. So there's a little bit of like, you can sort of have boundaries going in, and like, you can sort of train people how to interact with you and treat you. Yeah. 
And I think for me at least, thinking about how does my job affect my soul is really important. I used to think like, okay, I just have to like do the professional track and then like figure out how to be a Christian after. Like for me, like choosing jobs, switching jobs, leaving jobs, a lot of it has been like, okay, this is not like a healthy place for me. So how do I move on from this? Not just like, I'm not gonna go to work tomorrow. Like that's kind of rash, but like long term, like this doesn't make sense for me. So this work is eight hours of my day affects me. Like I would go home and I'd be a jerk to my wife and she'd be like, you're a jerk to me. I'm like, I'm sorry, like works hard. She's like, that's not an excuse for me to be a jerk to my wife. So I'm like, okay, either I figure out how to deal with this or I move on. And so I moved on eventually, like after two years. And so I think like for me to say like, <coughs> this affects me. And so I need to do something about it was something that I had to learn. Cause I was like, no, like I need to like just suck it up and do the right thing. Luckily, your wife helped you learn. Totally. That. So that's what I was going to mention, especially your question about kids and stuff. Uh, is and and how do we deal? If I'm a college student and I'm addicted to my phone or something, hypothetically. Um, uh, first of all, self discipline is hard. We already talked about that. Especially if you don't know what you're doing is if you haven't like gotten to the point where you realize that this is affecting mm. me. You know, a lot of times you guys are going to be in things. I, I'm in. Th everyone is in something, and they're 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 doing something sinful. And they don't even realize it yet. And they don't even know how to limit themselves yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is where your wife comes in, or your mentor comes in, your, your friend comes in, yeah. and they freaking help you. <laughs> and and <laughs> your or your parents. Yeah. You your like, parents. My kids then, don't know that you know eight hours of TV and chocolate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner right. is bad. I know that. They don't know that. Yeah. But I kind of am teaching them. Yeah. So, in both ways, you know, like parents should be um, uh, intentionally teaching their kids those things. And now you guys, as young adults, need to be intentionally asking for that kind of input from other people, from your friends, from your mentors, from your parents, still, even. I know your parents are weird. <laughs> so, so, maybe, maybe tagging out that, maybe. Uh, talking about boundaries and how to be intentional. Um, think of for every half hour you spend on your phone, you need to spend an hour with a real person. <laughs> Dang, you be with real people more than you have time in the day. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, but like setting like setting up something, like being intentional, okay, okay, I've been on my phone for this long, now I need to go spend time with real people. I need, I need real people in my life, not just avatars, not just a name, not just a friend that I've never actually met, but I've met on Instagram. Uh, I need those real flesh and blood inputs in my life. Yeah. Uh, another idea, like you, you talked about like, how do we know if something's good for us or bad for us? Um, I, I mean, like I literally think we can at the end of the day, like reflect too, like where, where did I notice myself coming alive today? Where did I notice myself? Um, Versus where did I notice, what took away life, what drained me, what made me like, uh, let's say, more fully human versus less fully human? I think most of us, right? Like, I, to use the ice cream example, like, if I reflect on the end of my day after, you know, eating a half a gallon of ice cream, I'm gonna probably realize, I don't really feel so good, actually. You're an eight hour never spinch, I mean, we've all, you know, hypothetically done that, like, but you know, what if, afterwards, you don't feel so good. Right. And so that, I mean, that, I mean, because the thing is, like, you know, that's, things have consequences, right? And that's, that's the whole point. And if you reflect on your day, you can start to notice what leads to life, what leads to God, and what leads to death. Yeah. I gotta say, Netflix does have a little mercy. At one point, it's like, do you want to continue watching? Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> but it only lasts like, it doesn't last that long. Like, they, they don't ask you that I long. I need to switch that too. Do you know how much of an idiot you're being? Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ours stays on there until you click a button. Yeah, mine does too. Mine stays on there too. It depends on the platform. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually yes seen, no. seen a, so one, you know, good thing. Um, as an That's why he works for Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> it has well, some redemptive well, qualities. So, so two couple things. Number one, it's interesting. A lot of like. A lot of techies are pretty um, not religious about like uh, isolating their kids from their version of tech and age. But I would also say that like you know people as people have be they become like increasingly aware that oh it's like literally exposure to technology is rewiring the human brain. Yeah. Um, and so there is a lot of active conversations now about like um, you know not just considering product decisions not just from the viewpoint of does it make more money will it increase more usage which is usually what most companies are aiming at. But there is, I would say, like a, a bit of a parallel track where people are also beginning to ask the question, like, mm -hmm. is this actually good for people, the human, the human race? Like, is this actually good? And like companies, 
are increasingly, this is not like super pervasive, but companies are actually beginning to make product decisions, you know, also mm-hmm. considering, mm-hmm. you know, that, oh, it's not just about this one metric, that there's other metrics that we can evaluate those decisions on as well, so. Mm-hmm. Along that same line, is there, um, this might just be a personal thing, but um, is there like, hidden gems in Netflix that uh, a Christian can go to to watch that are uh, edifying, or at least not terrible. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> in terms of content? Yeah, yeah. It probably would depend on the, I'm not the best personalization recommendation algorithm, but it probably would depend on the... <laughs> the kids That's a little weird the kids, the kids category. The, kids area. The, the, the Planet Earth one that just came out, I think is pretty popular, oh. if you're into that. Well, Planet Earth can get a little graphic. Right? Well, you know, <laughs> what? The, the chimpanzees. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't, I, I'm looking forward to watching that one. It looks very beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, there is. What's that? Is that the one that? Is that the one that like um? Hey. Not all the bad scenes for you? Hey. No, it's like that's 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 Angel. That's the Angel. Yep. Yeah. I haven't used Vid Angel, but I'd be curious to try it. So then, do you have to watch like the normal movie and then watch it on Vid Angel so that you know if it actually cuts out? Well, I guess I would have to test it that way, but um. You probably would pick up, right? Like, suddenly, hmm, the scene fast forward. <laughs> 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 Have you read uh, Nicholas Carr? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Shallows? No, um, I love it. It's, 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 actually, it's talking about the, the neuroplasticity and, yeah. and how, how technology has been affecting in what ways. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. Oh, it's totally fascinating. Yeah, really, really interesting. It's an idea like, um, like corporations, like big companies, they didn't like create these like Google, YouTube, Netflix, Snapchat, Facebook in order to like make it or to like kind of like, like like using our privacy, uh, like using like our time, like what we like want, like it's it, like it's been so like so like shaped in a way that like are geared towards us and like in a consumerist culture like like we really need those things like in our lives right so it's just like, um, like it takes a lot of like self-control by the holy spirit like to avoid some certain things um and just like like how do we kind of like um like we're like we're all like indirectly supporting these companies that's why they're so rich um in silicon valley you know, making a lot of money, but it's just like, how could we, like, um, I don't know, just like, think more about like, like what what do we what should we do with like privacy issues or just like, like, what what can like, um, like how do we kind of go about that? <laughs> so, as a question, you know, how do we act as moral agents? in a world, whether maybe the more, if it, if I'm hearing you use privacy as an example, like how do we function as a moral agent? Um, you know, we may not want to support a certain company because we think certain companies are doing, doing immoral things. Is that kind of the question? Yeah, like, we, like not just immoral, but just like, they help, they help us, like Google helps us find stuff, look for stuff, but it's just like, but, or in the, like Snapchat, like helps us communicate, Facebook helps us keep us updated, like, you know, we have a curated curi- curi- Facebook post. Yeah. It's just like, there's certain things that we need, we use. It's just like, like to what, to what point, like, do we have to kind of be like, oh, like, you know, maybe Facebook's using my data, like, just for, like, like just selling it to advertisements, or just like, or, like, how do we, how do we kind of, like, if the government can't control these major corporations because they've gone so out of hand, out of hand, become too powerful to even, like, like, because they have, like, super, um, like, um, they can hire lawyers from like Harvard that are like, too smart and they can like kind of get away from legal systems. Like how do we kind of like, like um, deal with such so, big corporations? I, I, I think, you know, like that's part of the conundrum of being in the world today. Like I think when I first started working um, when I, and I was much younger, I think I, you know, I think I kind of had this thought of like, I will never, did, I, I would not want to work for a company that ever does anything wrong. And then I pretty much realized, right, that if I adopted that mentality, I would have to be the Unabomber living in a cabin in Montana. Um, 
That was somebody that the FBI arrested a decade ago. I can see the Unabomber reference may have been lost on people in the room. I got you. You got me? Who got me? Got there you go, the Unabomber. The guy, and he mailed, he was anti-technology, so he totally isolated himself and he lived in a cabin in Montana and then mailed bombs out. Um, he mailed what out? Bombs. No one has ever heard of the Unabomber. Gosh, I'm old. Um, You're not bombs? Old. They're young. Yeah, bombs. He was, like, <laughs> bombs. It's not our personal yeah. decision. This is recent. Yeah. Okay. He was mail bomb, um, and he was like, yeah. I don't know why you brought him up, though. So anyway. And then you sent the mail, and then it exploded? Yeah, they yeah. opened the letter, and uh, boom. They but, were just referring to, like, he didn't have <laughs> technology, he was yeah. totally off grid. Like, I realized, yeah, exactly. This is something he lived off, off grid in order to not be morally compromised. And I, I guess I realized that, like, I don't know that it's possible to exist in the world without somehow being related to or engaging or interacting with um, brokenness, mm. right? Like, or sin or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I don't have a really good answer for you. I mean, like, I would say that there are, like, really red lines. Like, I'm not going to work for a company that is overtly, intentionally doing things that are malicious and hurting people, right? Like, I'm not going to do that. But I, I don't know that any one of us could ever work at a, at a truly good, pure, perfect corporation. Every corporation you're at, I guarantee you, name a corporation, if you think about it long enough, you'll be able to find a way where it's doing something that is contrary to God's law and to how God wants us to live. So, um, I don't have an answer for you, a really good answer. I don't know, Courtney, if you have any thoughts. She's the person that I look to, and it's a really hard question. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly what he was asking, so. Oh, yeah? Did I not hit it? Well, like, you kind of hit some points, like, as well, because, like, you know, we're all, you know, like, going to the workforce, and we have to kind of think about what you've done, like, yeah. as well. Um, I was just more thinking of, like, like, corporations aren't, like, like, well, some are, but most are, aren't, like, inherently evil. Mm -hmm. Like, they, they're not trying to, like, 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 control all of us, you know, and, like, use all the information to, like, it's not, that's not their, like, primary goal, um, I hope, <laughs> but it's just, it's just, like, but, like, it's just like, like we depend on these corporations, and these corporations depend on us, and there's like that sort of relationship of like, oh, like you know, we give them our data privacy, and then they they give us like entertainment, uh, information, all that we need. It's just like, um, like. And how do we not? How do? Yeah. Are you asking like how do we not further their power? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Well, I mean, one idea is you can join it. Right? Like, you can join the corporation as an employee and try and steer it for good. I guarantee you that corporations listen to some degree to the voice of their employees, um, for better or for worse. They right. also, oddly enough, at least in capitalism, uh, listen to their customers. Just they're the ones that are paying them. Uh, so, you have more power than you might think if you don't want to. If, if some app or company is manipulating you in a way that you don't like, stop using it, and they are no longer making money off of you. Now, you're just one person in the sea. Well, you know, um, this, if, if they're really doing something malicious enough that people are waking up to that and avoiding it, they're going to be losing money, you know. Um, so, I mean, it, you have more power in that way than you might, or it might think. Um, but... There's always, throughout human history, there's always been that kind of thing. Right now, it's just they're using technology to be manipulating people instead of wars, you know, <laughs> um, and or dictatorships, you know. Uh, so it's always a level of discernment that you have to have as an individual based on your values, which in this case are so I'm at, biblical. And, it's late, and yeah. yet for the sake of, uh, you can go ahead and ask me after if you want to, but or here, I don't know. But um, I think two things. Well, one thing I wanted to add was that I think one of the more underrated practices in the Christian life that we don't do in a culture of consumerism is fasting. Mm -hmm. The idea that I need, the spiritual practice to prevent this concept of I need is to say I don't need, which is fasting. So whether you do it during Lent, whether you do it with your mentor, whether you just do it once a week, fasting is not limited to food, right? We think, oh, fasting is food, less is second. They're not limited to something, right? Fasting is saying, I'm going to remove this from my life to say I do not need it, right? It's not saying like it's good or evil, it's just saying I need to fast. So 
That's one thing that I do sometimes, just to like, it's not like, you can fast for prayer, but you can also fast just to control your appetite. So like, this doesn't control me. And so that's one thing for you guys to think about in, in this context. And a comment regularly, fasting is rough when you first start, but, uh, yeah. but after you do it for a little while, you actually realize, oh, I feel like I should feel better. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's true. It is true. Dude, when you first fast, it feels like this is the worst thing I've ever just made the decision of. Then it's like, oh, man, this, I can do this. But yeah, um, it's kind of like a reverse effect of like when you eat that ice cream, like that whole half gallon, like you're like, oh, I want to do it. And like, oh, this is great. And they're like, oh my God, this is terrible. It's like fasting is like, oh my God, this is terrible. And like, oh, this is actually really good. Oh, this is great. <laughs> it's like a reverse. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's totally true. Kind of like exercise, true, too. Yeah, it's kind of like <laughs> exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Once you're in the routine, then it's fantastic. So yeah. Starting is hard. So think about that, <laughs> talk about it, and then accountability is great. And then lastly, let's get into our... Same, are we in the same small groups? 